Hi everyone, welcome to Business Concepts for Life Scientists. Today, we're gonna to be talking about finance. My name is Jashan Jackson, and I'm the Program Manager of the Entrepreneurship Center here at UCSF's campus. Uh, I'll be initiating this today, and then after, Christine will follow up with a few more topics that we'll discuss. So first, just some of the objectives. Uh, by the end of this class, I promise you'll be able to do the following. You'll be able to identify three different financial statements and how companies use them, read and identify the parts of a P&L statement, Calculate a burn rate, explain and apply concepts such as opportunity cost, cost of capital, and net present value, as well as apply these concepts in financial planning. But first, let's define finance. Uh, so corporate finance deals with the sources of funding and the capital structure of corporations. Uh, just a little step further, it's always important to remember that the purpose is always to increase the value of the firm to the shareholders. But within our context, let's think about biotechnology. So biotechnology defines finance as how the company will fund itself and allocate its financial resources. In academia, which some of you may be a lot more familiar with, is how the lab will budget uh, for its operations and manage expenses. So we're going to talk about three different categories today. The first category is revenues and cost. Um, so within that, we're going to talk about what the enterprise earns and spends, the second is forecasting. Uh, in forecasting, we're going to be estimating the funding of an enterprise. Uh, and then cost of capital is the required rate of return to make an investment. Sounds a little technically jargony uh, right now, but I promise you understand exactly what we're talking about by the end of this. Uh, so first, let's just go in uh, and talk about revenues and costs. Uh, so revenue and costs is how enterprises measure performance. Uh, so within this section, we're going to talk about an overview of the financial statements, and you'll be able to answer these three questions. How much revenue did Gilead earn in 2015? What was the annual burn rate for a company in 2015? Um, and at the current burn rate, how many months of cash does this company have remaining left? But first, let's go into the, the types of financial statements. So there's three financial statements which you can find online at the sec.gov. So public companies are required to file these financial statements um, so the shareholders have all the information that they need to make a decision on the company. Uh, these three statements are the income statement, the balance sheet, and the cash flow statement. The company we're going to be using is Gilead, uh, which some of you are familiar with. Uh, it's a biotech company. Uh, if you look at the bottom, uh, put these three because there's um, really consolidated information. Uh, it's a lot more at a high level, uh, some dashboards as opposed to diving, just diving directly into a 10K, which is full of text. You may get a little lost. So some of you might want to start with like Google Finance or Yahoo Finance, just because it's a lot more intuitive uh, if you're just starting off. So first, we're going to talk about the income statement. So the income statement uh, covers revenue and costs. It's also called a profit and loss statement. Um, the income statement covers the net income over a period of time. Uh, so the period of time we're going to be using is the year 2015. Uh, so if you look at Gilead's income statement, you can see all the way up top we have revenues. Uh, revenues is broken down into product sales, uh, which also has a line of royalty and contracts, as well as a few others. Um, it's important to know that these are clumped together into total revenues, and then you're going to subtract out some of the other expenses in the company. Uh, some of those expenses include cost of goods, uh, which you can see here. Cost of goods for a biotech company um, is usually you know, what goes into the direct cost, the raw materials of developing a drug. So these are chemicals, uh, raw goods such as uh, pipetting materials, capsules, um, et cetera. Uh, for research and development, it's important to look at in this expense, uh, this is where your salaries may come out of. As a scientist, um, as any technical person, Research and development encompasses some of these laborers here. Selling general and administrative expenses, uh, also called SG&A. Uh, here you can see where the marketing expenses are, sales team, uh, the executive team, pretty much all of the business side of things is, is kind of pulled out of this side. So you can see what the total cost of and expenses are. Uh, under it you can see there's a few others, but it, it's not really uh, at this stage, I wouldn't really dive too much into that. Just know that there's taxes and some other provisions that you kind of have to go through that you would subtract out. But right now, let's just keep it high level, revenues minus expenses. And you can see at the bottom, we have our net income to the company. Uh, the second statement we're going to talk about is the balance sheet. Uh, so the balance sheet pretty much encompasses the assets, liabilities, and equity. 
Um, different than the income statement because the balance sheet is just a snapshot at a period of time. So this can be, any, let's say, any day. Uh, the day we're going to use is the same as our income statement, which is December 31st, 2015. But just remember, it's a point of time. Uh, just an overview of the balance sheet. Uh, you know, as scientists, we love equations. So here's an equation. Uh, assets always equals liabilities plus equity. Uh, so total assets we're going to go over, but liabilities, just think of it as debt. Um, and just know that these two have to balance out. No pun intended. So here's a, consol here's a consolidated balance sheet for Gilead. Uh, if you look at the top, you can see cash and cash equivalents. Uh, if you look down another row item, you can see accounts receivable. Uh, so accounts receivable is um, money that you're waiting to collect. So you've already performed a service or you've already sold the goods at this company and just think of it like on a credit card. You know, you're just waiting to collect the cash from, this, from your customer. At the bottom, you can see property, plant, and equipment, also called PP&E. Um, here are like some of your hard, long-term assets, uh, such as land or a new manufacturing facility or some other large uh, asset that you want to just kind of clump into this scenario. So you can see at the bottom what our total assets equates to. Uh, next up, we're going to look at liabilities and equity. As I mentioned before, liabilities is just, it's, it's your debt. It's the debt on a company. It's what the company owes to any lenders. Uh, if you look down at the bottom, you can see retain earnings. This is your, the company's stock. So this is people have purchased stock in a company and they have equity in it. Uh, so you can see what the, what the retained earnings equals and then that's your equity. So if you add these two up together, what do you get? Uh, your total assets always equals your total liabilities plus equity. So you can see both of these equate to uh, 51839 the last statement we're going to talk about is the cash flow statement. Um, the cash flow statement encompasses three different activities. Uh, so it's where's cash moving between these three. Uh, one of those is operating, uh, the other is investing, and then finally financing. And again, this is over a period of time. Uh, so we're going to use the year end of 2015. Uh, so our snapshot is going to be coming from uh, December 31st, 2015. So let's talk about the concept of cash burn. So cash burn at a high level is just, you know, how much is the company churning through its cash? How much time do we have left before we essentially run out of money and we have to close the doors? Uh, so the formal definition we have here is it's an approximation of how much money a biotech company or a project uh, has is, and is using over a period of time. An example of that period of time can be monthly, quarterly, or annually for a longer term uh, strategies. Uh, and then it's also important to remember that within biotech, one of the things that we use is we just use the operating loss as, a, as kind of a good benchmark for what our cash burn is. Uh, so we're not using Gilead for this. You can see that the company name has changed to Portola Pharmaceuticals. Uh, and that's because Gilead is a, a really well-established, large, uh, not burning out of any cash right now anytime soon. Uh, so it, it's just not, not as good of an example as Portola which as you can see has a operating loss of 227 million. So let's just, let's just walk through the example of cash burn. So if you want to determine you know, how many months of cash does this company have left, you use this simple equation. Uh, you take the current cash from the balance sheet and then you divide it by the annual operating loss, you multiply it out by 12 months and you'll get the number of months that the company has left. Uh, so for this example with Portola, uh, we're going to look here. We can see that the cash that we pull from the balance sheet is $444 million. Uh, you can see the um, operating loss, as we previously mentioned, is $227 million. So if you divide those two out and you multiply by 12, you can see that the company has a little under two years left before it essentially has to close its doors or raise additional funding or increase revenue or decrease costs. <laughs> Uh, so again, those financial statements, as we mentioned, uh, one is the balance sheet, which is a snapshot of a period of time. Uh, if you look at the two, in the, middle, the two in the middle, remember these are a summary of a period of time. So we have our cash flow, which is where's cash moving between our operating, investing, and financing activities. Uh, you have our income statement, also called a P&L, or profit and loss. And just remember, it's revenues minus expenses, and it always equals the net income. Uh, just to kind of put things into context, one of the things we like to use is operating evaluation metrics. Uh, just because 20 million doesn't mean much to a company like Apple, whereas 20 million to a smaller company that's only doing, let's say, 30 million in revenue, 
uh, the 20 million means a lot more. So we like to create what are metrics or ratios. So you put that into a percentage so it becomes a lot more relevant to the specific company that you want to kind of evaluate. Uh, one of those metrics is gross margin, uh, also called profit, just to see you know, how profitable is this company. And that's just revenue, revenues minus expenses equals gross profit. Uh, you convert that into percentages and you'll see uh, in a relative context you know, how profitable is this company. Uh, the next one is net income. Uh, this is just cash to the company, just a simple equation. Uh, you really just want to see you know, how much cash is going into the company. And lastly, solvency, which is the ultimate uh, financial health uh, status of the company. So use this metric as we use for Potola just to see you know, how many months does this company have left before it essentially has to close its doors or really do uh, some hardcore capital restructuring. Uh, next up, we're going to talk about uh, Parallel to Academia. Uh, please refer to Amy's video, and she'll give you uh, a lot more of examples of you know, how do we use finance within academia, how she uses it in her lab, and you know, how does it translate to some things that are similar to other small businesses. All right, next up, we're going to talk about forecasting. So forecasting, as we mentioned before, is estimating the funding of the enterprise. Uh, so in this segment, we're going to talk about what is forecasting, why companies do it, and we're going to predict the use of cash for activities that the company may use in the future. But first, let's talk about you know, why do companies forecast? Uh, the main reason and the main goal is to uh, get a better grasp on you know, cash management. You know, where's our cash going? Where can we put cash today that can generate some more cash in the future? Remember, when it comes to companies and the finance side, uh, cash is always king. You know, where is our money going right now? Uh, the second, as I kind of alluded to a little bit, is strategy. So we can kind of strategize, you know, where do we put our money today? Uh, what activities do we invest in? What piece of equipment should we buy? You know, how much money is this piece of equipment going to give us in the future? Or we can just determine some long-term, short-term, and mid-term strategies. Uh, it's also important to remember that, you know, as science as we are and as technical as we may be, um, you know, forecasting really is an art and a science. The science you may be a lot more familiar with is the, you know, the math, the crunching, the equations, but there also is an art to it. Um, it's always important to remember that the one thing that's true about forecasting is that it will always be 100% wrong. You know, it's really just about backing up your assumptions, uh, coming up with really strong, supported assumptions for what you have. You know, why are you forecasting out this? Um, How did you get there? And it, it just makes it a lot easier from a finance side just to determine where the company is going to be going in the future. All right, so let's talk about you know, how do we use forecasting within organizations. So usually we try to mesh this in with you know, long-term, short-term, and mid-term strategies. So a long-term strategy usually is a, a much heavier of an investment. Uh, so long-term strategies is you know, what are we going to finance on an annual three-plus year type strategy? You know, what, what are we going to invest in today that we're not going to see a return for a long period of time or over a lengthy period of time? Where the short term uh, you know, finance strategy may be like for a, a one year or a one month or you know, just a really short term budget. Uh, so you know, what are we going to buy for office supplies or what are we going to buy this new machine for that we only use for a year or just you know, really small, um, you know, much smaller items. So here's an example uh, that some of you may be familiar with. So this is just the different stages of drug development for a company. Uh, so the short-term strategy, as you can see, would be just to demonstrate proof of concept within uh, just a few patients. Um, you can see we budget out how much that will cost, um, and we, we have a strategy map to it as to what we exactly get out. On the long-term side, you can see the cumulative amount uh, is roughly $240 million total, but the long-term strategy is, you know, how do we get this drug to market, commercially success, market this drug, whereas today, you know, we're just mapping out for that proof of concept. So let's use an example of it that you know, is, is a lot simpler to understand, uh, just to kind of get your grasp around some of the concepts of forecasting. Um, so here, we're going to use the very simple idea of, let's say, your daughter. Um, your daughter is uh, entrepreneurial at heart. Uh, she really wants to work and earn her dollar. Um, so she comes to you and says you know, she wants to sell lemonade out of a lemonade stand. Um, so for forecasting, you really want to predict, you know, what is this lemonade stand going to look like over the next three years? Um, so we're going to forecast 2017, 2018, and 2019, but you see the A next to 2015, 2016, because these are our actuals. So these are our actuals, also called historicals. 
Uh, so this is what we're going to base our, the foundation of our um, assumptions. So you can see our assumption column. Uh, some of the assumptions that you can see here is uh, you know, each year we're increasing by 50% the number of units sold as we went from 2016 to 2017. Um, and that's based on that, you know, your daughter sold 500 last year, she sold an additional 250 this year, so that's a 50% increase. So we're just using that as our basis assumption that 50% can be 35%, can be 100%, can be, you know, 200%. Um, in the end, it's just really about making sure that you, you, you have the credibility and validity to back up why you feel that percentage is going to be that number. So that's your assumption. Uh, so that's what you kind of manipulate within forecasting. But you can see we're pretty much just forecasting out a traditional income statement. You're just doing a simple P&L forecast just so you can see, you know, is this going to be viable for your daughter to do in the future? How much is it going to cost you? Is it going to be worth it? Um, so, you know, this is just a really simple example with the lemonade stand. but. Just wanted to get you guys a little more familiar with, you know, forecasting and uh, financial, financial statements. Um, so next up, we're going to be going to Christine. Please check out her video where she's going to finish off the finance section.